When we set out to do this research, we had a few suspicions about the rapidly changing banking environment. Contactless has long been touted as a secure predecessor to chip inserted transactions. But we wondered whether this was really the case or if it was more a case of the king's new clothes. So why is every startup these days a bank? You probably noticed that the banking environment has changed pretty rapidly over the last few years. Now it's possible to open a bank account without ever going into a branch or a physical building. Instead, it's possible to open a bank account purely through a digital application using a mobile phone. And whilst this has been happening, we've also seen a huge increase in the kind of merchant services that have been offered as well. So there's been a huge influx in merchant services or so offerings for things like mobile point of sales terminals. So with this rapidly changing environment in mind, when we came to produce this research, we came up with a set of questions that we wanted to explore around contactless and the banking environment. And those are, has contactless payments resulted in a fraud reduction? Is contactless a modern mode of payment? Are, pa are payments standardized? And what are the security measures inside of a contactless transaction? So let's talk about the first question, which is, has contactless resulted in a fraud reduction? If we look at official statistics provided by people like Visa, so the card brands, you'll notice that they seem to suggest that contactless has in fact resulted in a reduction of fraud. So they state that between 2017 and 2018 in Europe there was a decline in fraud rates of 40%, which indeed sounds pretty promising, it sounds really fantastic in fact. But if we compare these statistics to those provided by an organisation called Action Fraud, this is a body in the UK which is made up by the police, and it's an independent body that consumers can report cases of fraud to. So they actually indicate that fraud between the same period that Visa Europe talks about, between 2017 and 2018, saw an increase in cases, almost double in fact. And they state that on average, the average loss associated with contactless fraud in the UK was £650, and one particular case they investigated resulted in a loss of £400,000. So the trouble with looking at any of these kind of statistics is it's a bit like looking at this animal. Animal. So from the front it looks a bit like a shark and from the back it looks a bit like a tiger but in fact it's neither. Because we don't have access to the raw data points we can't really make any assumptions or conclusions about what's happening with contactless fraud. So it's really difficult to say, has contactless actually resulted in a fraud reduction? So this leads us on to our next question, which is, is contactless a modern mode of payment? So I think we all assume when a new technology comes about that in some way it's an iteration, an improvement upon the previous form of technology. So we wondered, Assuming that this is the case, in what ways is contactless an improvement on chip-inserted transactions? How is it better? If we look at the history of payments, this will give us a better idea. So in 1979, we see the first implementation of electronic, electronically transferred payment information. So Magstripe was invented before 1979, but it wasn't until 1979 that the first point of sales terminal was implemented. Then we see a huge use of Magstripe in the beginning of the 80s. And with that, we also see that 
criminals start to understand the ways in which they can manipulate this technology and the ways in which they can carry out fraud. So a real classic case of fraud associated with Magstripe is the restaurant scenario where you go into a restaurant, you enjoy a lovely meal and at the end of the meal you ask for the bill or the cheque and you give your card and it's taken away with the waitress or waiter and they go and swipe your card but instead of simply swiping their, your card they swipe it twice so there's this opportunity in time where they can actually take a second reading of your card and either make a second payment presumably to a fraudulent terminal or they can actually clone the card itself so one of the biggest problems with magstripe is that it's really susceptible to cloning so with all of this going on, the card brands started to see that there was a significant problem and they started having some discussions in the early 90s trying to come up with a solution that may be suitable to solve some of the issues that we associate with Magstripe. And they eventually came up with a standard called the EMV standard and they formed a consortium called EMV Co in 1996. So chip inserted transactions were meant to provide uh, solutions to many of the issues associated with Magstripe. What chip did is it brought about a number of different technologies that we actually don't have with Magstripe. So we first of all, we actually have authentication of the card itself, which we don't have with Magstripe. So this is done through asymmetric cryptography and we know that the key is stored on the chip itself. We also have verification of the card holder which normally takes place either through a pin code or through a signature depending on where you are carrying out the transaction and depending on where your card has been issued. And then we have the signing of the transaction itself through a cryptogram so the whole transaction is packaged up and has a level of integrity associated with it. So this all sounds great and it was great for a very long time and then in the beginning of the sort of the early 2000s we see that the card brands start thinking about newer forms of technology, ways that they could get us to spend in a secure manner but in a faster manner. So the solution for this was NFC or contactless and the first implementation of this was through MasterCard and they had an initial trial period in 2005 and then later in 2007 Visa came up with their own implementation of the technology called Visa Paywave and so as I said NFC is meant to have us spending more money quickly in, a, in a, at least as secure manner as chip inserted transactions. But there's a sort of big caveat to that, which is actually when we look at things, when we think about is contactless truly an iteration from a security perspective um, compared to chip inserted transactions, that's not necessarily the case. So if you look at how contactless works you'll see that NFC actually includes a legacy mode so support for legacy forms of technology such as Magstripe equivalent that chip doesn't, doesn't at this point and it also uses the same key and same areas of memory on the chip as a chip inserted transaction so the answer to the question is this a modern form of payment? Yes, it is from a technology perspective, but in many ways it isn't an, an iteration or improvement from a security perspective, at least from what we see so far. So the next question we sought to answer is, are payments standardized? Now, unfortunately, if you want to understand how payments work, you will have to go through somewhere between 600 and 700 pages of documentation on the ENV Co website. But in addition to this, what you'll find is that a lot of the documentation associated with payments is proprietary. So that means it isn't publicly available, which proves to be a big issue if you're trying to learn about payments. So what we're going to do now is talk a little bit about the actual workflow 
um, of contactless and how that works. So interestingly, in fact, MasterCard and Visa, although they're very similar, at the point where they adopted NFC, the way in which they carry out NFC or contactless transactions differs slightly, and we'll get into that part as well. So here's a short description of how EMV works. So first of all, Contactless uses NFC to transmit data, and NFC uses inductive coupling. So the first thing that happens when you go to a shop and you try to make a, a payment is that the terminal provides power to your card and initiates the transaction. So it wakes up the card. The next thing to know is that EMV provides or describes a subset of protocols that allow for the processing of payment information. And within contactless or within any kind of EMV protocols or we call this set of the subset of protocols kernels. So the first kernel, kernel one, is responsible for some types of Visa card. Then we have kernel two, which is for MasterCard. And finally, we have kernel three, which is also for some types of Visa card, along with JCB. So when we look at the individual chunks of data sent between the terminal and the card, they take a form called Application Protocol Data Units, or APDU. And within each message that is sent, the data takes the form of something called Tag Length Value, or TLV. And this is a hierarchical structure. So within each tag, you can also have nested tags. So if we look at this example of some data that's sent between the card and the terminal, it looks a little bit complicated to understand, um, but it's actually not too difficult. So the first line, if we read that, we can see this 6F, which tells us that this is the file control information template. And all this means is it's defining the data for contactless card communication. And then we have two pieces of data which tell us how long the communication is going to be. And then we have this value that starts with 32504159. And this is the binary value for 2pay.sys.ddf01. And so this is just telling us that this is the payment system environment for this particular card. So again, this is a little bit more complicated to understand, but if we have a look at things at the logical level, it's quite a lot easier to understand how this works. So as I mentioned, the first thing that happens is that the terminal is going to initiate the transaction, it's going to provide power to the card, and it's going to wake up the card. So the first thing that it does is it asks the card, what payment proximity payment system environment do you work with? So it says, do you support Visa? Do you support MasterCard? Or do you support American Express? So this process is just the process of reading the proximity payment system environment or PPSE for short. The next thing that happens is the card responds to the terminal with something called its application identifier. So this is where it tells it, I support the following modes. So I support, for example, Visa. I support Visa's smart card debit structure and perhaps something like MagStripe mode. So it will respond with the modes that it supports and in the order of priority. So again, this is the card is responding with its application identifier. The next step is that the terminal is going to select the application identifier that it wants to work with. So in this example, it's going to select Visa. The next thing that's going to happen is the card is going to send a list of information that it requires in order to complete the transaction. So it's going to send things like the currency, the amount, the unique number, and something called 
the terminal transaction qualifier. So it's just sending a list of information that it requires from the terminal in order to carry out the transaction. And this is called the processing options data object list. The terminal is then going to send the requested data to the card. So it's going to send the currency for the transaction. It's going to send the amount the unique number and its terminal transaction qualifiers. And this is quite important. So in the terminal transaction qualifiers, the terminal specifies the kinds of modes that it actually supports, the modes of operating. So it's gonna send all the requested information to the card and it's going to issue a command called generate the application cryptogram. So it's gonna ask the card to generate the application cryptogram using this information. So the card is then going to respond with its with the cryptogram for the transaction and it's going to send back importantly something called the card transaction qualifiers. So this is a list of the kind of modes of operating that the card supports. So for example whether it supports online pin function, whether it supports signature or whether it supports uh, a mode called consumer device cardholder verification method. And this in fact is something that if you use a phone or a tablet that supports NFC or contactless modes, then this will actually issue CDCVM. So it's not typically associated with a physical card, but is normally associated with a device. Then at this point, the terminal, once it has received that information, it's going to carry out a risk analysis. So before it can determine the next step, it's going to look at a configuration file which contains a list of different limits depending on the transaction, depending on the merchant and the region that you're in. And this will define different spending limits for the types of transactions. It's going to compare that information to the card transaction qualifiers and the terminal transaction qualifiers. And this will determine the next step. So at this point, it is either going to be able to send the transaction to the card networks and eventually to the card issuer to determine whether this can take place or it's going to ask for cardholder verification. So it's going to step up the transaction and ask for something like a PIN or a signature. And I'll now hand it over to Tim, who's going to talk about the next section. Thank you. Uh, so this research mainly is about how to bypass a cardholder verification for example, by avoiding presenting PIN for Visa cards. But in fact, in order to bypass it, we need to bypass other features such as offline authentication and online authorization processes. So let's speak about them deeper. So ODA or offline data authentication, it uses RSA cryptography, so terminal will ensure that the card was actually issued by the bank. And there were two older versions of ODA schemes. First one was SDA, static, and the second was DDA, dynamic. But in fact, neither of them ensure uh, the terminal that all information passed by the card is genuine and not tampered. So unless card uses the most modern uh, ODA scheme, which is called CDA, it's very easy to change a cardholder verification and, for example, saying that instead of PIN, I want to use signature or I want to use no CVM and no cardholder verification will be required for this transaction. So that was basically the main reason why Visa and MasterCard diverged when they were implementing NFC. So Visa decided that their customer experience and rapidness of the transaction is the most important and more important than some useless security features like OTA. So that's what happened when uh, NFC was implemented. MasterCard set CDA as mandatory and now it supports for contactless transactions for most of their cards. 
and if for some reason CTA will be failed during the transaction, transaction will not leave the terminal and terminal will, re will reject this transaction. Visa done the opposite, uh, they put CDA as not mandatory just because CDA increases the time when cardholder needs to keep the card in front of the terminal and this is not very convenient and they decided that convenience is more important than security. Next, both Visa and MasterCard have subsets of different versions of cryptograms and most of their cryptograms, most of MasterCard cryptograms for example use uh, all essential fields which are required for cardholder verification decisions where uh, for example MasterCard uses CVM results fields or TVR, AIP to make decisions and what kind of decisions has been made to pass it along to the issuing bank. Visa on the other side decided to implement fields which are called CTQ and TTQ cardholder uh, card and terminal transaction qualifiers which are uh, using for exactly the same purpose for making a decision for cardholder verification and other risk management. Surprisingly, uh, in none of Visa cryptogram versions, CTQ or TTQ are not are presenting. So there are three most popular t uh, cryptogram versions: CVN10, CVN17, and CVN18. And actually CVN17 is the most popular, so we met it in more than half of the cards we were working with. And there are only four fails, amount, unpredictable number, transaction counter and issuer application data. So imaginary situation, hackers want to clone a transaction from, from, from your card and use it in the future. They definitely can pre-calculate the price, let's assume that they are going to some big supermarket and they're going to buy the TV and they already know the price of this TV. Uh, there, there is no date in, in this list of fields, means they don't need to predict at which date this fraud will be carried out. And the only one field is UN, as you can see, and if for some reason terminal is malfunctioning or if for some other reasons hacker can force UN to be a specific value, that's it. That's basically the only one protection mechanism against cloning the ter against cloning the transactions, and that means that more fraud can be carried out. Other versions of cryptograms like 10 and 18, as you can see, they have more fields. However, there are either no CTQ, no TTQ, means that this information doesn't go to the issuing bank. How MasterCard conducts the cardholder verification. So at the beginning, card provides CVM list to the card, to the terminal, saying what features it support, does it support PIN, signature or no CVM. Then the terminal will respond in the generation of the cryptogram request saying that this is the cardholder verification results, what exact cardholder verification method has been chosen to make this transaction. And the card will take all this data and put it as an input for the cryptogram, uh, wrap it around offline data authentication scheme CDA and pass it to the terminal. Terminal will decrypt it and if nothing is tampered, if cardholder verification methods are not tampered, everything will be alright, the terminal will pass cryptogram to the acquiring and issuing bank and the issuing bank once again will ensure that none of this data was tampered. So Visa will do things in the opposite way, much more simplistic way. So terminal will provide TTQ, uh, terminal transaction qualifier, when it simply indicates whether transaction requires a card holder verification or not. That's it. Then card will provide CTQ field where it will say what card holder verifications are supported, PIN, no CVM or CDCVM, so which are essentially for the mobile wallets. We'll put information like amount in a cryptogram and give it to the terminal. Next, uh, Visa for their terminals, when they certify uh, terminals for Visa contactless transactions, they do not require to pass CTQ or TTQ fails to the acquiring and issuing banks. And that's why most of terminals will not send this information. Uh, 
but so what each in bank will receive will receive amount the country of the terminal and maybe online pin if it was presented some terminals actually provide CVM results fields which was inherited from ENV or MasterCard that probably just due to the fact that it looks a little bit insane if the issuing bank don't possess any information of what cardholder verification has been made. So that's exactly what we shown one year ago on our research. We shown how to con transactions, how to make these transactions without entering PIN, how to bypass hard and soft limits in the UK and in Europe. This time we are going to talk a little bit more about how to protect, how to spot the vulnerability, what issuing banks can do. So let's assume we are talking about contactless transaction for £46. Yeah, uh, so CTQ and TTQ fields are useless. So they are not checked during the offline data authentication and terminal will not pass them to the issuing bank, so bank will not receive this information. Next. Our attack is about pretending to be a mobile wallet, but in fact, if the transaction has been made using a mobile wallet, it will be absolutely different from a regular card transaction, because regular card transaction has fields which are called, uh, which are collected in field 55. They collect all information related to uh, EMV transactions or similar, where if the payment was made using a mobile wallet the only one information that bank will receive is the token which was substituted with uh, for the original card and some other original card information so it will be a distinctive difference between both of them if transaction has required pin and pin was entered this encrypted information also will go to the issuing bank as I said, CVM results are not mandatory for Visa contactless transactions, but some terminals actually give this information. So this is very useful. This is exactly the moment when you can spot the attack that someone pretends to be a mobile wallet, for example, because uh, if transaction is made using a mobile wallet, CVM result fields will put to offline PIN which is the equivalent for CDCVM. And we all probably know that offline PIN is not the way how contactless transactions can be checked because for checking offline PIN, you need to tap your card twice and this is not very helpful. So let's try playing game and spot a fraudulent contactless transactions. So first one, 1,000 pounds online PIN was presented. Seems legit. Next. 1000 pounds, no field 55, token instead. Also good, that means that transaction was made using GPay or Apple Pay. Third one, 1000 pounds, offline PIN. That's a clear indicator of <coughs> fraudulent transaction where <coughs> CDCOM attack was made, how we described it one year ago. Next one, 1000 pounds, no online PIN, no offline PIN bad or at least suspicious because of very high price but it still might be terminal which accepts only signatures and last one 100 pounds no online pin even we don't know because it might be a genuine transaction which required signature or it might be some type of fraudulent attack and the problem is that all of these five transactions will be and probably should be accepted by the issuing bank the thing is that Visa says that card issuers are ultimately responsible for all type of fraud and validating the transactions. The problem is that they don't have sometimes enough information to understand is it a fraudulent transaction or not, as we can see at the moment. So now let's talk about the transaction amount. As we saw before, 1000 pounds is clearly too much, where 100 is pretty much okay yet. So that's exactly what PSD2 states. So PSD2 is a modern payment uh, service directive which regulates payments in Europe. And one of their features is strong customer authentication, which says that if customer spends 
totally more than 250 euros or do more than five transactions is required to use pin and use chip until that contactless transactions will be disabled and this is a reasonable idea that good examples of reasonable limits where certain amounts still can be spent using contactless without cardholder verification using tap and go but at some point you still need to, to enter pin the problem is that psd2 still has a few issues first of all even in europe it's still not across the board and that means that not all cards and issuing banks support it. Next, we already found a few issues uh, related to cumulative limits and we published a white paper showing how these restrictions can be bypassed. So we were trying to say that all Visa cards all around the globe are vulnerable. If we'll talk about European or Asian cars, which mostly will require online PIN, our attack can be applied and we need to change CTQ to signature or we'll need to change CTQ to no CVM and transaction will be made without PIN. If you'll be talking about US cars, which by design support fixed signatures most of the time, the attack is about changing CTQ only to no CVM so customer doesn't need to leave a signature on the receipt. If you are talking about UK cards, the, they will not allow to use online PIN, they will require to use chip instead, and the attack is about changing CTQ to mobile wallet CDCVM, and also this attack requires to change in CTQ fields. We said a year ago why this attack can't be simply replicated for MasterCard, and the answer was that most of all MasterCard cards contain CDCVM bit in AIP field, which is the part of every cryptogram. But if you'll go deeper, over the last three years we checked something around 60 different cards in Asia, Europe, America, Visa, MasterCard, and we found actually a few ways to bypass PIN for MasterCard cards as well. If you'll think broadly and look at this spreadsheet, you can see that MasterCard contactless transactions CDA is mandatory when for chip transactions it was not mandatory and it's still mandatory for Visa it's the other way around so contactless transactions don't require CDA at all where in the uh, chip Visa cards still you might find cases and we found one of them where CDA was required and the whole concepts of attack against offline data authentication is that for MasterCard, we try to present data using chip. For Visa, it's the opposite. We try to present data using contactless. So for MasterCard attacks, we are reading data using mobile phone with NFC enabled features and send it to data and put it as, uh, as chip using some sort of EMV card simulator, how like you can see on the screen, which was made by Omar Chudari. For Visa cards, it's the opposite. We read data from the card using chip readers and send this information using the mobile phone with NFC. So one of attacks that we found for MasterCard card reminds me of the original attack which we carried out against Visa Google Pay. So just to remind you, uh, CDCVM on Google Pay always is set to 1 and the only one thing attacker needs to do is to convince the phone that cardholder verification is not required by changing field from TTQ that CVM is not required and in this case payment will be done without unlocking the phone. The same is going on with MasterCard. Uh, what we need to do is we need to change CVM results field saying that CVM is not required. The problem is that in most of cards, as I said, CVM results is the part of the payment cryptogram and this attack will be spotted and transaction will be declined. However, over the last year, we found one card which allowed us to carry out this type of attack. Another interesting scenario that we found related to card which actually allowed dynamically to change CVM methods and this brought to the construction when CVM list was uh, stored in a place which was not used for 
checksum controlling over CDA. That means that we were able to change CVM list saying that no CVM should be cho chosen and transaction still would not be cancelled on the terminal. Second attack that we discussed one year ago was about replay, cryptogram replay. So the idea is that as long as malfunctioning terminal presents the same UN, card can present the same cryptogram and ATC and highly likely this transaction will be accepted on the issuing bank. Over the last year, we found around 30 vulnerable banks and we communicated about found issues to all of them and most of them took some steps and fixed vulnerabilities, uh, at least one they were able to fix, which is really good, but some banks are still affected by replay attacks. In conclusion, we checked now around 57 cards, Visa, MasterCard, all around the globe, Europe, USA, the UK, Asian countries, specifically for Black Hat Asia, we checked uh, Indian and Kazakh Visa cards and MasterCard cards, and we can confirm that this attack can be applied for Asian cards, that means that transaction can be made without knowing PIN, without presenting PIN or signature. The good part is that customer essentially is not responsible for all type of contactless fraud unless they disclose their PIN code somehow. And the responsibility lies on merchant or issuing or acquiring bank. And we, you can see potential problem here, yeah? So issuing bank don't have enough evidence, enough information to say what fault, whose fault was that and what actually happened, whether it was fraud and, or it was a genuine transaction and customer tries to apply for, for a fraudulent transaction. Acquiring bank is not responsible for settings on cards or sometimes even on terminals. And as you can see, all this comes to this game of blaming each other, such like a hot potato where issuer will uh, try to blame acquirer and vice versa. As I said, the good part is that at least customer stays far away from that. You can read more on our websites. We present most more researches around contactless and contact payments. Uh, thank you for this session.